Donald Trump announced that we are withdrawing all of our troops from Syria, and this left many people wondering what is going to happen to the Kurds. And in his announcement, he also mentioned that Turkey would be uh, invading into Syria and setting up a safe zone. Well, that has now happened. As of now, the Turks have started to uh, make their way into Syria with the idea that they're going to be creating the safe zone where they can uh, repatriate Syrian refugees who are spread out across the, the region. So let's talk about what this means for the Kurds. Um, are we betraying our allies? Should we or should we not be exiting Syria? Was this abrupt? We're going to go over all of that in this episode. And I have to say that I did a lot of research on this. I was meaning to do a video about this yesterday and even the day before. But the more I dug in and the more uh, the deeper I went into the research, the more just layers and layers of of things started to kind of unfold. And I got to say that this is one of the most interesting conflicts that I have come across. The Kurds will make you question everything you believe. Uh, I mean, it is once you start to peel the onion layers back, the Kurds will make you question everything you believe. And we are going to get into that. It is so interesting. So um, this is going to be a long video. And because of that, I want to give you just a quick Cliff's Notes version to start off. And but I do encourage you to watch the entire thing so that I can kind of unpack a lot of the stuff that's going on that'll help you see the, the picture much clearer when it comes to what is going on over there with them. Um, long story short, we are seeing at play in our media both sides, Democrats, Republicans. You've got uh, it, this act of solidarity, it seems, between people like Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, where they're basically coming together and saying, Mr. President, you should not be withdrawing troops from Syria. What we're seeing right in front of our faces is the military industrial complex, the defense lobby, and the magic that they've been able to make happen for them in Washington. All of them are bought off. The media is bought off. The defense lobby lobby is brilliant. They've been able to convince both sides as to why we need to remain in war, why we need to keep troops in regions that we do not believe that we do not belong in, that we're essentially occupying right now illegally. Um, and you know, magically, they've been able to craft narratives for both sides that work with both sides' sensitive sensitivities. And we're seeing that right now in front of our faces. This is why we can't end endless war, because the defense lobby is so crafty. The media uh, gets in on it. Both sides get in on it. And anytime anybody says, you know, we need to withdraw troops or we need to not go to war, people freak out and say, oh, my gosh, how dare you? How dare you? How dare you? And that is where we're at right now. So long story short, besides the military industrial complex, obviously having their vice grip on our government and our media, we are illegal occupiers in Syria right now. We have no permission to be there. It is someone else's country. Um, we need to leave, point blank. We need to leave. Now, people say, yeah, but do we need to leave this abruptly? Um, no, we don't. But guess what? This wasn't abrupt. This is the time to leave because the announcement was actually made in December. And I find it very interesting that the same very media outlets who are right now screaming, saying, wow, this was abrupt and sudden and unexpected, are the exact same media entities that reported back in December when Trump announced that we are going to be withdrawing all the 2,000 troops from Syria. They all freaked out back in December. And then Trump said, OK, I'll give it four months. We'll do a slower withdrawal. Well, it's been 10 months. so. Over the course of these 10 months, the same media outlets have also been reporting. Now, this never really made big news, but they had been reporting the various little meetings that Trump has been having with Erdogan of Turkey about creating this safe zone and talking to him about um, how the Kurds need to be kept safe. Also, some media outlets, some not in America, some in America have been reporting the various talks that Turkey has had with other nations to also ensure the safety of the Kurds. So that would include members of the EU, NATO, um, even Russia. Putin has been having conversations with Erdogan about this. Um, the Iranians have been having conversations about Erdogan about this. Assad has been having conversations. Everybody in the world has been having conversations about keeping the Kurds safe. So this is not a sudden thing. This is not like, oh, my God gosh, this came out of nowhere. No, it did not. This was reported in December. All of the, you know, the internet doesn't, once it's there, it doesn't ever go away, right? Well, it's there, media outlets, so we can go back and read the things that you wrote back in December. So don't act like right now this is all of a sudden, sudden. It's not. So um, this has been a long uh, drawn out negotiation with the Turks and the Syrians regarding the Kurds. 
the negotiation that they came to. So now the other big question people have is what about the Kurds? Are we abandoning the Kurds? We there are allies. We made a deal with the Kurds. Well, again, trying to keep this portion of the video short. I know I'm already getting long here, but um, the, the Turks, by the way, are our NATO allies. They are our signed in ink allies. The Turks have the second largest standing army in NATO. We would need them if if it came down to it. And uh, they are our actual ally. Now, the NATO alliance is if we are to be attacked or invaded, we go to each other's rescue as if it was ourselves. So the Turks kind of had this like WTF moment when when we decided to partner up with the Kurds who are their sworn enemy. And I'll get into why they're their sworn enemies. I know that a lot of people have some preconceived notions as to what that might be, but I'm telling you, you don't know. Uh, or maybe you do, but uh, I didn't know. And then I found this information out and it is so fascinating. So we will get into all of that. But um, the the Kurds, we made the, the only deal we made with them was they were fighting ISIS. Uh, ISIS had invaded their territory in Syria. They were fighting them with or without us. So we did not recruit them into this battle. We did not coerce them into it. We didn't say, hey, come fight for us. That's not how that went down. They were already fighting ISIS. ISIS was in their land. ISIS was taking over their villages. So they were fighting ISIS with or without us. We showed up and said, we can help. And they said, great. How? And we said, we'll give you arms. We'll train you. We'll try to make things a little bit more cohesive and organized. And they said, yes, that's great. Cool. Let's do it. So that's the agreement we made. We did not make any other agreements beyond that. We didn't say, okay, now you're our allies, we'll protect you. That was never part of the deal. However, we did say to them, now we will not engage in military battle with our NATO ally. We will not do that. That is our red line, we will not cross it. So you cannot engage with Turkey while we're helping you out with, you know, with our military, with our, uh, with fighting ISIS. So now that ISIS has been contained, um, you know, this is kind of like the end of a movie where there's two people and they're fighting the common enemy. And then at the end, then they're done. The enemy is, is defeated. And then they turn to each other and they say, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And they both, you know, shake hands and wish each other luck. We're kind of at that point with the Kurds, except the problem is what the Kurds said to us when we said, so what are you going to do now that this is over? The Kurds said, well, we're going to go and try to take land from your NATO ally. And so that is where we have to draw the line, guys. And we have to say, you know what? Best of luck, Godspeed, but we got to go now. We can't engage in that. We have an alliance with Turkey. We cannot help you or even stand bodyguard for you while you go and potentially invade and try to take parcels of land from our NATO ally. That's against our alliance. That is the bottom line and the long and short of it, okay? The Kurds have an agenda that unfortunately we cannot support. Uh, we negotiated a deal with the Turks saying that there would be a 300 mile long, 20 mile deep safe zone where we would demilitarize it. The Kurds would have to move back. And um, and that's where the Turks plan would be to repatriate Syrians. So and, and also to hold ISIS captives. The problem is now in the last 10 months, everybody's been talking about this with the Kurds. The issue is the Kurds don't want to do it. So it's really largely incumbent upon them at this point uh, that they Everybody in the world, almost everybody in the world, the EU, Russia, Iran, United States, everybody has said safe zone. OK, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you guys just need to move your bases and the Turks won't bother you. And the Syrians are saying, I mean, the uh, the uh, Kurds are saying no, no to that. So, um, you know, if they want, they know the consequences of sticking around. They understand that completely. They understand that keeping their military bases right up on the Turkish border, right in their face, is threatening to Turkey, and that Turkey's not going to tolerate it, and that they've had a long-standing agreement with Syria that they are allowed to go into Syria up to five kilometers. Now, I think Turkey's planning on going even deeper in and violating that, and that's between Syria and Turkey. Not our business, guys. Not our business. But... Um, that the the Turks have every right to defend their borders. And you know what? The Kurds have every right to ignore it. But the Kurds don't have a right to ignore it and then not have to fight it. Right. So if you're going to go and threaten somebody else's land, you got to be prepared for battle. OK, I look, I'm not going to judge them. Whatever they want to do. Godspeed. Like I said, Godspeed. OK, now let's get into the longer, the longer, more interesting aspects of this. The Kurds. Now, who are the Kurds? So 
when I started off on my research and I started reading about the Kurds and the, the persistent per persecution, they are a very persecuted group. They are the fourth largest ethnic minority in the Middle East. Um, they have their own language, their own culture. They are their own peoples. Uh, they're really kind of a more of a conglomeration of tribes. So there's various different dialects and they're not necessarily one cohesive group. Um, they're just kind of an ethnic group with various different tribes that make up sort of a you know, a, an umbrella group that we call the Kurds. So they are very persecuted. They've never had their own country ever. They've never had their own lands. They've never even really had ancestral lands because they've been pretty nomadic. So, um, you know, they moved around. They've kind of, but they've stayed within a general region of mountainous areas within the Middle East. They, they're they largely found in uh, large sections of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And because they've always been this big minority within all of these various different nations, they've never they've never really been given full rights. There was a lot of persecution. The Turks in particular were very brutal to the to the Kurds and um, promised them many things. And and uh, basically both Turkey and Syria had done these various different tactics to sort of eliminate the Kurds by basically making it illegal to call yourself a Kurd, to speak Kurdish, to adhere to any Kurdish customs. They essentially wanted to aggressively and forcefully assimilate them. And in a lot of ways that has worked. There's a lot of Kurds living in Turkey that you wouldn't know are Kurds. They don't identify as Kurds. It's illegal to do so. So they don't say that they're Kurds. And oftentimes they start to intermarry with Turks. And, you know, then it all kind of becomes a little bit muddled as to who's what and who, you know. But Turkey, they think, is about 15 to 20 percent Kurdish. They don't know because you're not allowed to call yourself Kurdish you know, in Turkey. So they're a highly persecuted group. When I first started reading into them, I, I, I looked at them similar to the Palestinians. But I was wrong. It turns out that the further you go into research, the Kurds are more similar, I would say, not to the Palestinians. Now, I made those equations with them because I thought, OK, a stateless people, they haven't really had, you know, a place to call their own. And they've always been sort of in other people's territorial grounds um, and persecuted and, you know, people shoving them around. But actually... I would say now, with all the research I've done, that the Kurds are much more similar to the Israelis. And the reason is, is because, again, a highly persecuted group. So you've got, you know, uh, or I would I would. So, yes, the Kurds in general, I would say, are more like the Jews, how they've been very persecuted group. But there is a faction of these Kurds that are part of this. Uh, sort of uprising. They've got various different acronyms, but the PKK is the largest one in Turkey. And there's the Syrian uh, group that was the Y. I get all of these, um, all of the different acronyms confused, but they're all essentially this one particular political movement of Kurds that have this idea of creating this uh, nation, kind of this utopian nation. It's got a very utopian ideal of how the nation would be run. And uh, and they want to call it Rojava, I believe. Or maybe they're going to maybe someone to call it Kurdistan. I'm not really sure. But um, they've got this. It's very similar to some of the Zionist Jews ideas of creating this this homeland and they could run it the way they want and and, and the you know everybody could immigrate to it and it would be this kind of uh, utopian land for them that is very 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 similar to what this group is wanting this group of Kurds now these are a, a militia group of Kurds and they're the ones that are in that northern Syria area that have been fighting Isis they're the they are these kind of Rojava idealist Kurds and there's many of these sort of Rojava idealist Kurds that live in Turkey, but not all Kurds share the sentiment. So, again, it's very similar to Zionist Jews. Uh, not all Jews are Zionist, but lots, I, I would say all Zionists are Jews, pretty much. Uh, it's the same sort of thing with this sort of Rojava idea. So... Over the last 40 years is really when this sort of Rojava idea of creating this land uh, really rose up in popularity amongst the Kurds. And 
they and and many of the Kurds joined in on this and and decided to, to take up arms and they are very effective fighters. The Kurds are not helpless people and they're also not, you know, blameless people. They have engaged in various things throughout history that, uh, yes, they've been very persecuted and very oppressed, but they've also done some pretty shady things. Like, for example, they took part in the Armenian genocide. And they've now since apologized for that, but they were massacring Armenians. Um, they've also been accused, even of late, as they've tried to create this Rojava sort of land. They have been accused of ethnic cleansing in the regions that they sort of take over uh, because they don't really have an ancestral land. You know, they're they're nomadic originally. So they but they've got this idea of where they want this Zionist sort of, you know, I, I say that, but yeah. Um, this utopian land, right? So they've got this idea of where this utopian land is going to be. And, um, and, uh, but people already live there, right? So when they get there and these people already live there, then there's a bit of a conflict and they've been accused of ethnically cleansing the area to create their little, uh, utopia. And, um, so, you got to understand that this agenda of this very militant group of Kurds that are excellent fighters, they've got women fighters who are badass warriors. They've got women, complete women units. Uh, they've got women commanding other units. Women are fighting side by side along the men in the front lines. They are not to be messed with. They are not to be, I, I would never view the Kurdish fighters as weak or uh, in any way victims in any way, shape or form. They know what they're doing. And they're very clever. Now, this issue of these, of uh, really a couple hundred years, but now over the last 40, they've really wanted to rise up and create this sort of nation. One of the issues that all of the nations where they live in, because they do live primarily within the borders of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, the beef that these nations have is twofold, okay? First of all, if you're this group of Kurds and you say you're going to create this utopian land, first question, where? And the second question, it would be, is that land already occupied and does it belong to somebody else? And the answer is, yeah, that land does belong to somebody else. It belongs to all those other nations. And it is occupied by, like I said, various uh, people that have been there for a while. And a lot of also Kurds live in those areas. So they feel like, hey, we've been here and we've been here for a long time. We've got large populations. So this is a good area for us to be in. Well, um, yeah, you know what? Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria are not going to give up land without a fight. So that's your first problem. If you decide you're going to create this utopian land, you've got to realize that these other nations aren't going to carve out space for you and just say, go ahead, right? They're going to fight you for it. So you've got to prepare yourself for battle. And the Kurds very much have. So the one beef that these nations have is they're trying to take our land. Okay, they're trying to take territory. The second beef that these nations have is... Every time an enemy comes along and threatens these nations, the Kurds in this particular group, this, this utopian Rojava idealist sort of Kurdish group, they rise up and join the enemy. So this is very, the, the nations that uh, the Kurds end up turning on are nations where these Kurds were born and raised. These are their lands. These are not like they've been moved there or they're trapped there. I mean, this is where they were born and raised. And they they get to a point where they realize that maybe the enemy is going to help them carve out the land. I, the, the Kurdish idea is, well, if the enemy comes in and the enemy wins and we fight alongside the enemy, then maybe we can convince the enemy to carve out this land for us. So that's sort of been the Kurdish thinking this whole time. So they have numerous times throughout history, risen up and joined the enemy. And that has been much to the chagrin of their countrymen, much to the chagrin of their governments. And it creates a lot of mistrust. And that mistrust and that betrayal leads to oppression. And that oppression that the Kurds then feel leads to more uprisings. And it becomes a sort of circular thing. So, of course, you can understand because originally the Kurds were very oppressed. You can understand why they would dream of this utopian land. Same thing why Jews would dream about having a Zion land, right, where they're going to live and not be persecuted anymore. If you're a heavily persecuted group, I think you can fully and completely understand why you would want this land, why you would dream about this and why you would even if you were so oppressed and life was so bad for you, why you'd be willing to raise up arms and even go to battle for it. So I absolutely do not blame the Kurds for their desire to create this utopia that they want to go and live in. 
But I'm also going to say, hey, listen, I also can't really uh, I can't blame these nations for wanting to to defend their territory and their borders. I I think that's totally reasonable as well. So I think they're all kind of reasonable in their in their demands, which is why I think we absolutely just have to stay out of it. Let them figure it out. It's going to be bloody. It's not going to be good. They're going to battle it out. You know, I'm not I'm not for us engaging and in, in intervening and uh, sticking our nose in somebody else's battle. That's their battle. If that's what they want to do, Godspeed. OK, so. Um, so that's kind of the issue that these other nations have with the Kurds. They feel betrayed. They feel like they're always against them. And the history books show that is that they're not wrong in that. The Kurds have absolutely always seemed to rise up with the enemy and take sides with them and then try to defeat their own governments that have tried to help them. Syria, that, that's a particularly sore spot right now for Assad. Uh, Assad did a lot trying to help the Kurds. Um, they did have squabbles and, and battle each other out. And then Assad sort of said, you know what, I'll give you all Syrian citizenship. You know, you're kind of stateless people. You're nomadic. And I'll give you Syrian citizenship. And he's even discussed carving out parts of land for them with the caveat that it couldn't be right up next to the Turkish border because Turkey's sitting there saying no way in hell they cannot be here because every time they show up here they try to find us because they're trying to take this parcel of land so Turkey is saying no you know and, and Syria is saying just be Syrian and the Iraqis at one point uh, when they rose up against Saddam Hussein the the Iraqi Kurds rose up against Saddam they joined Iran during the Iran Iraq war that was a, a big betrayal to Saddam. He essentially committed an act of genocide against the Kurds in uh, retaliation for their betrayal and massacred about 182,000 Kurds, gassing them with gas that we provided with Saddam Hussein at that time, because at that time, the United States was allied with Saddam. Was We were supporting the Iraqis and Saddam Hussein in their battle against the Iranians and the Iraqi Kurds. Eventually, though, obviously, Saddam Hussein was toppled out of Iraq and... Um, and the Kurds were able to carve out their own semi-independent piece of land. So they're pretty much they're pretty much autonomous, except it's still not officially their own nation. It is under the umbrella of Iraq. They don't like that. They've recently tried to hold a vote to secede from Iraq. The other nations in the region are not allowing them to because they understand what the end game is. They know that really ultimately this particular group, this political movement within the Kurdish group is... Um, the ultimate end game is to create this Rojava sort of nation where they would all live. And that would be uh, that's sort of an existential threat to these other nations. Um, so uh, now what's really interesting, too. So and, and by the way, the the Kurds are very much allied with the Israelis. Uh, this is sort of where the the Kurds question kind of force everybody to question their morality or their political ideologies, okay? Because on one hand, here's what's interesting about the Kurds. They are extreme leftists, this particular group, this party. I'm not talking about Kurds in, as a whole, but when I say Kurds, I mean this particular group, the PKK sort of backed Kurds. They are extreme leftists. And I mean like they, their Rojava nation that they want to create is like communist or socialist or, or it's really com it's communal so they want a, a more of a socialist communal almost anarchist in some ways um uh, very utopian very egalitarian men and women would be equals that there would be equal placement with men in the political groups as men as men you know women and men equals completely that they would have that if uh, if a man is in political power then a woman needs to be as well and they're they're very progressive and when I say utopian, in a lot of ways, like really a utopian idea and I, a place that I think sounds, hey, you know, that sounds like a pretty cool place to live. So they've got this very leftist ideology and this really endears them to the leftist crowd. Right. So a lot of liberals love the Kurds because they love what they want to build and what they stand for and how secular they are and how egalitarian they are. And they are seemingly wonderful in this ideology. But here's where the problem comes in. Interestingly, they're backed by the Israelis and Benjamin Netanyahu, who is absolutely not a leftist. So many leftists do not agree with Benjamin Netanyahu, and yet Netanyahu is sitting there saying, go for it, Kurds, because they're essentially doing something very, very similar to what the Israelis are doing in, uh, in that region of the world. Also, um, the Kurds, because they are, when I say similar to the Israelis, uh, the Zionist Israelis, is that 
they don't really have any alliances. It would be false to think that we are allied with the Kurds because the Kurds have no allegiances. And I don't mean this to say to, for this to sound negative, but it is just the honest truth. The Kurds have one agenda. It is to create this utopian state and they will partner and they will turn, you know, they'll partner with anybody who's who will help them get it and they will turn on anybody who is not. So you can go one minute from being their ally to their enemy in the snap of a finger. They don't have real allegiances. Their only allegiance is to creating this nation. So um, now they do partner with us from time to time because, you know, ISIS came along and ISIS was threatening their territory and threatening their creation of this region. So they say, look, we'll, we'll fight with anybody who wants to fight ISIS. Um, but make no mistake, the minute that they, if we have a, a, an absolute enemy and that absolute enemy, enemy says, look, uh, PKK, we will help you carve out this land. All you have to do is turn on the United States. I think they would do it, guys. I, I, I think they would. They are very interested and invested in getting this nation and uh, nothing else matters. So I think it would be very unwise for us to believe that they're just our allies no matter what. And that's the way it is. That is not the way it is. And secondly, because they have been ruthlessly trying to gain this region to create this land, um, they have been ruthless. And when you're a leftist and you're thinking of this utopian, you have to also think about the consequences of being sort of a settler colonist, right? Like you, they're going in and they're demolishing villages and they are trying to take it. And then they make an excuse for it and they say, well, no, but they were ISIS supporting villages. And then when Amnesty International and the UN comes along and investigates, they say, okay, so we found like two people who were ISIS supporters and you guys took out the whole village. Um, that doesn't sit well with leftists, right? At least it's not supposed to. So the Kurds will challenge your every ounce of, thinking like are you for this utopian sort of socialist communist uh, hyper leftist land, uh, envisionment of a country but at the expense of all these human rights abuses and at the expense of encroaching on other people's territory and and trying to bust through other nations sovereignty on the left that's one side and you know having the backing of netanyahu uh but on the other side on the, on the right wing side, this is what I think so I find so interesting with these politicians right now is they're all saying we got to support the Kurds. The, you know, there's Republicans or we got to support the Kurds. We got to support the Kurds. This is how big of warmongers they are. You know, they go around saying we must fight socialism. We must fight socialism. I mean, do we let them in on this, that this whole Rojava nation that these Kurds are going to create is like a socialist nation, that they're they're fall, that these are basically a group of commies. <laughs> I mean, Do we let the right wingers in on this? Uh, and it just goes to show that they are willing to 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 be opponents of war, no matter who it is that they are. Uh, as long as there's war, it's almost like they don't care. Right. They're, they're willing to throw all of their political morals out the window. They claim it's because they're fighting socialism. But when when defending these socialists actually means remaining in war, they're all about it. Um and that's what I find so fascinating about the whole entire thing is it, it is a very complex issue um, with these Kurds. And uh, but I think once you kind of wrap your mind around what their agenda is, then you can kind of understand why we cannot be a part of it, uh, why we can only just kind of shake their hands and say, wish you the best of luck. You know, if you can if you can get it done, may the best man win. Right. If they can defend their borders, they get to keep the land. If you can take that land from them then I guess you get it. That's how history works. That's the way it's always been from the dawn of time. People battled it out for land and the strongest one won. So if you can be the strong one, I guess you get the land. That's the way it's going to go. But we ourselves have got to go and back out of it. This is a conflict we cannot get ourselves into. The Kurds will be fine. They've made their choice. They don't want to exit that safe zone. They want to hold their ground. They want to remain right up to that border of Turkey because they ultimately want to get in there and take Turkey too because you have to remember They've got um, the same Tur the same Kurdish fighters on the other side, on the Turkish side as well. And they're all kind of battling together to try to get this land. So, um, yeah, guys, Godspeed and good luck. That's where that's where we're at. But we got to get out of there. So that is the long story 
uh, somewhat short. There is way more to this history, but I only have 30 minutes, guys. So I'm going to wrap this up right now. And hopefully that explains some things. Um, but uh, they, they have been given many opportunities to be protected. They have choices that they can make. They're choosing not to do that. We just have to get going. And I guess the Turks, you know, they understand the, the consequence. So thank you so much for watching.